Assalamu alaikum. Today we'll start uh, uh, the first lecture from Tetralogy of Fallot. Uh, this lecture will be about the diagnosis, how to diagnose the Tetralogy of Fallot, and the next one will be about uh, the repair of the Fallot. So, um, the Tetralogy of Fallot, we depend on the diagnosis and clinical uh, items and on imaging. For the clinical, how, how do you know uh, a fellow patient? What is the most remarkable sign in the tetralogy of fellow patient? The what? The, the clinical presentation. Cyanosis. Cyanosis. Okay. So tetralogy of fellow patient is a cyanotic patient. We will come to that later. As a, as a revision, this is a normal heart, and this is tetralogy of fellow patient with tetralogy of fellow. The psychomonic pathology in tetralogy of fellow that this corner septum between the aorta and pulmonary is deviated anterior and cephalic. So it is deviated from the corner septum, producing all items in the tetralogy of fall. So we have here, but this is the corner septum, deviated anteriorly, we reduce stenosis in the RBUT. And we have here the overriding, the overriding of the aorta. So aorta now overrided the BSD and become overriding LB and RB. And we have a pulmonary stenosis from this subpulmonic uh, corner septum, producing obstruction here. And sequentially, we will have the right ventricular hypertrophy because of this obstruction. So this is the tetralogy of fallow items and the basognomonic thing in that, that anterior cephalic deviation of the corner septum. Here. So this patient have an RVT obstruction and have a VSD, right? So now we will have right to left shunt on this BSD because now we have uh, a pulmonary stenosis and we have decreased in pulmonary blood flow. So this patient will have a cyanosis. So the cyanosis mainly in this hemodynamic dependent in RVT obstruction and the magnitude of the right to left shunt. So we will have central cyanosis. Okay. Clinically, we have a approved child, so we have central cyanosis that the arterial saturation will be around 70, more or less, and it will not be present at birth. It takes some time. So usually, if you have a call from uh, the neonatology ICU that we have a approved child, tetralogy fallow is not the first possibility. So why? Why of that? Why the tetralogy of fallow is cyanotic? Because of, because of decreased pulmonary supply. So because the pulmonary blood flow is lower than normal, usually the neonates have what, what they have as extra blood flow, as extra pulmonary blood flow. They usually have a duct. So the tetralogy of fallow, usually it takes time. It's usually presented in early childhood in months, but not as a call from the neonatology uh, Okay, central cyanosis. Actually, we have a preferred cyanosis, not our subject today, but central cyanosis that we have circulatory or ventilatory problem lead to decrease in blood oxygenation. So usually we have the arterial oxygenation between 70s and uh, 80s. It does not appear at birth. Usually it takes some months to, uh, to, uh, to, um, to be recognized due to the presence of the duct. Is it clear now what about, uh, uh, what about uh, uh, the major, major feature in tetralogy of fellow clinical is cyanosis, is central cyanosis. Now we, we understand it's mainly due to the decrease of pulmonary blood flow. Okay, the hemodynamics of tetralogy of fellow, we have wide spectra from cyanotic fellow and we have also pink fellow, what we call it a cyanotic or pink fellow. And both of the, them depend on what we have seen, that we have an RBUT obstruction and they increase the magnitude of shunt is right to left in that. And also the, cyano the acyanotic or pink fellow, usually we think that this pulmonary supply, which is low in fellow, have another source like collaterals, like a duct. So this is the broad spectrum. Usually the majority of tetralogy of fallow presented in the first one is cyanotic tetralogy of fallow. Because we have right to left shunt, so this patient usually have extra cardiac 
problems which have a major impact on their hemodynamics. So because they have right left shunt, they always polycythemic patients. So they are hypoxic, they stimulate the bone marrow, they have more blood supplies, more, more RPC than normal, so they polycythemic. They have disturbance in their hematological system, so they are subject for clotting, but as well as for bleeding. Due to the right to left shunt, this is not uncommon to have a patient with brain abscess, with a stroke, with bleeding, so usually check this. Uh, the lung and the kidneys and, uh, and, um, uh, are usually affected in this uh, cyanotic patient. Most of them are um, uh, symptomatic from gout due to the distractions of the RBC. So usually check the extra, uh, extra cardiac system for that. From the cardiac point of view, they are, uh, have a burden from the arrhythmia and they are subject for infective endocarditis. Now it comes to the, the question, what do you accept the, how uh, the, the hemoglobin level, which figure is accepted for that uh, patient? Is it the normal, the 12 and, uh, and 10 is accepted for these patients? No. These patients are polycythemic, so the accepted figure for hemoglobin in the of fallow patient is around 20, so 19, 20. If the patient of the of fallow presented by hemoglobin of 10 is anemic. Is that clear? So we do not accept, we do not accept the hemoglobin, the normal hemoglobin of 10 or 12 for a tetralogy of fallow patient. The accepted level of hemoglobin should be around 20 and 90. We advise against the bean section in those patients. I'm, I'm speaking about the adult group, but we advise strongly against the bean section. We should keep the hemoglobin level around 920 for this patient. Okay, this from the clinical point of view. For our investigation, ECG and tetralogy of fallow patient usually sinus, we have the manifestation of the right ventricular strain. So we have right axis deviation, we have RBH, this is common in that. They are subject for arrhythmia, but this is outside of this scope, maybe in the next lecture after repair, but this is what we expect in the ECG. In the X-ray, this is a very famous X-ray of tetralogy of fallow. They usually call it put shift or current support. Why that? Why we have that? Core shift uh, means the mediastinum is small. This mediastinum is small compared to the size of the heart. Why the mediastinum is small in the tetralogy of fallow patient? Due to the small size of pulmonary arteries. This is very characteristic for tetralogy of fallow patient uh, x-ray. Okay. Now we will move from the clinical point. We have uh, we have covered the major aspects in tetralogy of fallow in, in a brief way. Now how to diagnose tetralogy of fallow? We have initial diagnosis that we said that we should demonstrate the enterocephalic deviation of the coronal symptom. We have to demonstrate the overriding of the aorta and the RBH and the level of obstruction. This criteria is the initial diagnosis of tetralogy of fallow. But tetralogy of fallow, each patient is a peculiar patient due to the additional lesion. So we have to have a checklist in our mind. This is a fallow, so we call the diagnosis of the tetralogy of fallow, but we have to prove or disapprove the additional lesion in the tetralogy of fallow. Okay, the initial diagnosis, usually done by echo, and this is more than enough. It's very uncommon to send the patient for cross imaging, uh, imaging technique or for CAT to ask it to coin a diagnosis for tetralogy of fallow. So echo is more than enough. Now we will ask ourselves about the rule of cross imaging, CT and MRI, and if we need a catheterization in diagnosis of tetralogy of fallow, that we, we will go through this lecture. Okay. The initial diagnosis, this is the views of tetralogy of fallow. What, this is the subcostal view. Here we demonstrate this is the corner septum, is anteriorly deviated, closing Sorry. or narrowing the RBT. This is the basognomonic feature about the tetralogy fallow and can be demonstrated by it. So this is subcostal view and we have here, this is the septum, we have a VSD, this is the aorta and this is the corner septum anteriorly deviated, reduced here obstruction in the RBT 
with the leasing of the color. So this is number one. And here, this is subcoastal view. We have two ventricles here, right and left. And this is the aorta, and this is the septum. If you draw an imaginary line, we will find an overriding of the aorta. However, aorta is still belong to the LB. So this is overriding of the aorta. And here, color, we have laminar flow across the BSD. So it's bidirectional and going to the aorta. This is number two. Okay. We call this view a fallow view. This is also subcostal view. We have here, this is the inflow of the right ventricle. So we have here right atrium, right ventricle, and this is the aorta, and this is the RVUT narrowed by the anterior cephalic deviation, and we have here the acceleration flow. So these three views combine 2D with color. We have diagnosed the fellow, right? Anterior cephalic deviation of the corner septa. We have overriding of the aorta. We have an obstruction in the RVUT, and therefore we have a hypertrophy of, RP, uh, of the red ventricle. This is RPH. This is classic views for the fellow, and here from the parasternal short axis view, you can measure the pulmonary arteries here, and you can measure by Doppler the obstruction of this. Can be done from a subcostal view, but this is demonstration of short axis. So usually the initial, the initial diagnosis of the tronchi of fallow can be done quite confident by echo. This is the way that pediatric cardiologists to do the, the loops. So here, we moved from fourth chamber view, mitral and tricuspid, aorta. We find here a BSD. More anteriorly, we have here the pulmonary with acceleration flow. This is sweeping from the, the, the fourth chamber view to the short axis. Is it clear now? OK. I make it loop more, one more time. So this is. For chamber view, mitral tricuspid, more anterior, we find here the BSD and the aorta, and this is the pulmonary with the lesion. So, initial diagnosis of the trilogy of fellow should be done confidently by echo, and the cross imaging has no role in that. So very unusual, very unlikely to send the patient is just to call in a diagnosis of the trojan Okay, as we said, that additional lesions is very frequent in the trojan fellow and should be addressed. Why it should be addressed? Because every fellow should be corrected surgically, right? As Hatem said in previous lectures, that, that coining of the diagnosis equal to have a surgical repair for better prognosis for that uh, patient. So additional lesion have a major influence on the timing, the time of the repair. So we have a checklist now, we have to go through it if you have it or not. There are five things. If you have additional BSDs, what about the coronaries? What about the level of obstruction in the RV, pulmonary branches, and do you have a source of pulmonary blood supply. I'll start with the last one. When we, when we do expect to have an additional source of pulmonary blood supply, not if the patient is not cyanotic. <coughs> so to fallow is a cyanotic, have a central cyanosis like what we mentioned before. So we find the to fallow patient as cyanotic patient between 70, high 70s, low 80s. But I've found the to fallow not cyanotic, so I should expect that this lung receive extra blood supply because we have different causes for cyanosis, but the trilogy of fallow under the category of this patient is blue because the lung does not receive enough blood for oxygenation, okay? Okay, additional B is this. Why we say additional? Exactly. The, the BSD in the trilogy of fallow is that the BSD. So the BSD here, that we have a BSD that 
we call could be premembrous, could be um, subarterial, like what we mentioned in the previous lecture. But we have here anterior cephalic division of this corner septum and the BSD. So this is the BSD and the trojopa. And here, what kind of uh, of BSD is that? It's premembrous BSD. Why it's premembrous BSD? Short axis between the aorta and pelvis. Okay, exactly. That the 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 border of this BSD is by the continuation between the aorta and tricuspid. This is another view. Okay. The additional BSD that we call it intertrogeal fellow usually muscular. So it could be somewhere like apical apical BSDs here. It could be some somewhere here. So additional BSDs uh, usually present a thirty percent of the trojophile. It's difficult to be detected in the Why? Because they refer why We have a large BSD, the BSD, in, in the Trojophallum. Therefore, the pressure of, between the RV and the LV is usually equal, and we have a PS by the anterior cephalic division of the gonal septum. So actually, the other BSD remains silent as as initial diagnosis that preoperative remains silent. So actually, we depend here in the flow of the blood between the both ventricles. But in that case, usually this VSD does not work. If we ignore them and we just send the patient to be repaired and we close the large VSD, the PSD, what will happen? That they will represent themselves by excessive shots, like what we call, uh, what we will talk about it next time. Like this, for example. This is another example that we, sh we see here a defect in the, in the septum, but when we put color, you can see something here, but this is a modified, very modified view. We can, you can easily miss this type of PSD. If we suspect that we have an additional BSD, what we should do? Should do CT. That we call. So the, the, the CT usually have a better spatial resolution compared by MRI. So for anatomical detection, we go for CT. CT is a 3D volume, so you can be orthogonal on the images. So you see here at the fact, and you see it on the perpendicular space. To have this nice images about intracardiac structure, it should be gated. <laughs> CT can be done as gated CT and as non-gated CT. It's not the scenario for MRI. All the MRI images are gated. So for CT, we have to ask if we are looking for intracardiac structure, we have to ask for gated CT. What does it mean, gated CT? That it's linked by ECG. So if I saw images, I can detect systolic images and I can detect the diastolic images. Roughly, that we start by R and end ended by R. Roughly, we say that half space between the first R and the cardiac cycle is systole, and from the half of the circle to the other I is diastole. And usually, we make it phases by 10%, so 0%, 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%. This is the usual, but we can make it 15. We can make it 100 phases. It depends on how you would like to have it. But usually, we have it only in 10 phases. But we can make different. If you, for example, found a best systole phases in 63, Percent. It can be done, but this is not the common language. We make it like 10 10 percent of that. So from zero to forty, it's a systole, and from forty to the one hundred, it's diastole. If you would like to check for bus for muscular BSD, it's smart to go for the systolic phases because the heart is expanded and not contract contracted. If the heart is contracted in systole, you might miss the small BSD during systole. So if you suspect that you have a pitfalls or drop out in the septum, 
it's better to do a CT for the, for, the, for the patient to detect the muscular BD and ask for a gated multi-slice CT. Look carefully in the diastolic phases, not in the systolic phases to detect it. As we said, it's quite common in 30%. So if you have 10 patients, three of them will have an additional BSD. It's a quite important to detect it before the operation because it's harmful to leave a tetralogy of fallow patient with a BSD. We will talk about that next time. Okay. For the coronary anomaly. Coronary anomaly is also not uncommon in the tetralogy of fallow. It's about 36% of the patient, they will have uh, abnormal coronary. They will have, uh, the, they have different anomalies. They might have a bridging. They might have abnormal origin of the coronary. But what we're looking for, a particular anomaly, that a major coronary crossing the RBUT. This coronary could be LED proper, could be a dual LED. So we have an accessory LED that comes from RCA or we have the RCA itself, or we have a coronal branch. The, the, the last one is really not practical because, because no one uh, have a definition. What is the enlarged conus? Conus is there, so we will forget about that. So our question is, do we have LED or RCA crossing the RBUT? Why we ask this question? Because the RBUT usually is the place where the surgeon will target to repair the tetralogy of fallow. And if the coronary is crossing this area, uh, it's not nice to have a cutted coronary. For a reason, they don't, they are not able to repair coronaries if they cut it. <laughs> for a reason, we're looking forward to have a solution for that. So having an LED or RCA, will it change the um, surgical management for another choice? Or maybe we make it later, so we have to report that there is, there is a coronary crossing the RBT. In children, it might be an option to see a coronary, but it's not option in the community. It's not working. OK. I have, I have a problem in my movies here, but my this. OK. This is what, we, what, what we're looking for in children, because the penetration of the ecosystem is quite good because they are babies with the small size. So we're looking in the short axis, we're looking for the coronary. So we have here the, the left system and somewhere here the right system. So actually, this is the figure of what we got in the real time, not in the textbook uh, images, that we got that we have here an abnormal flow is going there. We couldn't trace the coronary, but we got an idea about it. So again, if you are not able to detect the coronaries in a good way, or your patient is adult or a big, so make it low profile to ask for a CT. This is one of the reasons that we should make the, the, the low profile to ask for a CT for our patient. This is, for example, another, another view that we have here, short axis. We have here a vessel. It's coming anteriorly. It might be an abnormal, <coughs> abnormal course for one of the coronaries, this here, and when you put the color is here. In that case, it's nice to address by echo, but you have to demonstrate it by CT. CT is the cross imaging modality for the coronary. MRI does not have a role for that. In the old, in the old days, before the CT become faster and available in every place, um, um, it, it had been done by coronary cath for that, uh, that, but not nowadays. So now in the clinical practice, you do a coronary CT for that child and just to trace the coronaries, how they are going. So for example, here the left main, here the left main, and it's go getting the RCA crossing the RBUT. This is the way that we do it by, MR, by uh, the MPR. And also we can do it by the 3D reconstruction for that. The bottom line is coronary anomalies is common in tetralogy fellow. From our center, we have a publication about uh, the incidence of coronary anomalies. We found the bridging, we find anomalous origin, that it's uh, coming um, intra-arterial or retro-aortic, but this anomaly does not have an implication on the surgical management of tetralogy fellow. What we are focusing on, that 
RCA or LED is crossing the RBUT. And you have to answer this by echo if you can. If you are not able, do a, a multi-slice CT. This multi-slice CT should be gated or non-gated? Yeah. It's gated. It's intracardiac structure related to the movement of the, the non-gated CT. We do it for the aorta, for pulmonary venous drainage, for pulmonary arteries, for the structure does not move. But this should be gated. Okay. Is it clear? Okay. So coronary anomalies, multi-slice CT must have, keep it low profile, low profile, because awareness of the coronary artery diseases anomalies change at the time and the type of the operation. Level of RBET obstruction. The bisognomonic change that happened in tetralogy of fallow is the anterior cephalic division of the corner septum. By default, each fallow patient have some sort of subvalvular obstruction with this anatomical feature, right? Now the question is, is it the only, the anterior cephalic division of this septum, the only source of the obstruction, or does have this baby or the patient have valvular obstruction in the, in the pulmonary valve, or they have a supravalvular obstruction? So the question is, is relieving of this subvalvular obstruction is enough to repair this fallow, or can we use the pulmonary valve and pulmonary annulus? Is it usable? Or we have to do something for suprapulmonary? So to identify the level of the obstruction that started by, sub by subvalvular, by this coronal septum deviation, what we expect to have an answer about that. Is it valvular also associated with subvalvular or suprapulmonary? So the level of the obstruction is mandatory. So this is the coronal septum deviated. Now the question is how valve looks like and the how the annulus is. Is it small? Is it big? And how is the subvalvular is affected? So this is again um, the um, uh, fallow view, subcostal. So we have here inflow and we have here outflow. And what do you think about this? Pulmonary. It is subvalvular and the annulus is really small. So it is combined between valvular and subvalvular. Here, this is another case of fallow. This is short axis. So we have here the aorta, we have here the anterior cephalic division and we have here the valve, and we have here the branches. So what do you think about the element of subvalvular? Is it severe like the previous one? No. It's mild subvalvular, and if we put a color, we will find that this, the here, the subvalvular element is not that much. So if the surgeon removes the subvalvular, so the problem is still in the bulb, but the annulus is okay -ish. So we see the annulus, we have to measure it for the Z-score. So this bulb could be usable. What the importance of this point, that this we don't, we don't have to put a conduit in this child. We don't have to remove this pulmonary bulb. We can use the native bulb. So which give preference that native bulb is still usable. And also we are not started to uh, consume time for a conduit that might be that will be generated in over time. So this is really a crucial point about that. Some cases are really difficult, like this patient, for example. We have an adult patient, it's the trolley fellow, and we got something. What this actually this is a, a real life scenario that not all the tech, the picture will be textbook and pretty. We were this is we have here short axis. It's dull, but we, we detect that we have here in the pulmonary area, we have aliasing, so this is an obstruction. And when we put the, the doubler, we got that. We got that. That we have here, in that dull view, we have a bridge gradient of 80. Could anybody tell, tell us where is the obstruction? It's somewhere, somewhere in the RBUT. So we ask for a cross-imaging modality. So look for that. This 
how it was like. This short axis we have here an, an, an obstruction somewhere. We are not able to see where we are. This was the echo view and this was the CT view. So this, the same patient that we had, we did a CT for, for her. And this is the anterior cephalic deviation of the conal septum produced a very narrow RBOT. And look for the, uh, the pulmonary valve. Pulmonary valve is okay. So we have a good pulmonary valve. The obstruction here is mainly subvalvular, producing this narrow RBOT. And this annulus is okay, and this bulb is okay. So different scenario. So when the surgeon removed this obstruction, the coronal septum, the patient, this bulb is okay, and this one. So this is what we got in the clinical, the clinical scenarios, in the daily scenarios. Some images like that is difficult. So we will not send this patient for surgery based on the echo. So some cases are really challenging and you have also to think about how to, to, to draw a better anatomy for that. And this information was very useful for this, for this patient because this patient have a repair of the drology of fallow with preserved native valve. Again, preserved native valve is a good result because the clock is not ticking about the generation of whatever conduit you will put it. So this is a useful information. Level of obstruction by RBOT is crucial to be detected. If you can do it by echo, like the previous cases, that the two cases that uh, what uh, have seen now, okay? If you have a doubt like this case, send it for multi slice CT. Again, multi slice CT is your imaging to detect anatomy by better spatial resolution. This CT should be gated or non-gated? Why? Intracardiac. If you have it non-gated, so you have respiratory uh, ECG artifacts and it will mislead you. Okay. So RBUT, when needed, ask for multiple CT. Now we will go for pulmonary branches. You have we we measure the pulmonary branches, the LPA and the RPA, in the Mm, uh, pre bifurcation So actually, we uh, this what we measure it in that. Okay, what we see in here, this is again short axis. We have here premembrance VSD. We have the pulmonary, and we can see here the RPA clearly. LPA is not in the view. Okay. I didn't see it. Okay, you will not ask for CT for this patient. You will not ask for a CT. Okay, so he has some suspicious about this view, this uh, this coronary. But yeah, if you will not ask for CT, I will take it like a, yes, there is a coronary. Okay, the second view also in the pulmonary arteries. This is suprasternal view. It is short axis. So we have here superior vena cava, we have aorta in a short axis, and this one is right or left? Right pulmonary artery. Usually we find here the right pulmonary artery. Okay. Okay. To measure the pulmonary artery, the third view, here the same view. So we have it here from the start to the end. How we measure the pulmonary, the pulmonary branches? Nowadays we use the Z score. So we measure it, and we just uh, it's a pre uh, it's a pre branching. We measure the Z score. So if it's more than minus two, minus three, minus four, it's a small. We report that. Uh, I put it here because this is a very famous the Magoon ratio. Many centers like our center does not depend on that Magoon ratio, but it's nice to have it. So to know about it. So what in the Magoon ratio? What we measure? We measure the diameter of left and right pulmonary arteries at pre branching point. And we divided them by the descending aorta diameter at the level of the diaphragm. The idea is, by this Magoon ratio, we tested the hypothesis that the pulmonary arteries are big enough to carry the, pulmonary, the, the, the full cardiac output and they are big. 
it had been used for several times so the normal is if you have the right and the left so and divided it by the diameter of the aorta you will get a ratio of two but we are not aiming for that in tetralogy of valve so if it's more than 1.2 you can close the bsd and let let all the cardiac output go through the left and right pulmonary if it's lower than 0.8 so it means indirectly that these pulmonary arteries are really small and they are not capable yet to receive the whole cardiac output and you have to think about another solution other than total repair so magoon ratio have been for a long long time the the ratio to measure it there is another indexes for that but currently we do not use it we depend on the Z -score. Uh, Z score mainly because this is more related to the body surface area so we report in each in each echo or each CT how Z score is and it depends also on the surgeon to just visualize it and you might use different things happen like measurement interoperative so no, interoperative measurement again depends on calculation that related to Z score patients not so not to the magoon not to the magoon not to the magoon magoon does not uh, look for the body surface area. So this goal is much, much accurate for that patient. Okay. Now for the pulmonary artery, for uh, for the branches, we have to look carefully for um, origin stenosis for that and report it because if we have an origin stenosis of any one of them, it had been uh, reported to the surgery and it ha it has to be corrected during surgery for that for the stenosis. Okay, and we measure the, the, the diameter of both of them. It's not uncommon to find that we have here an RPA and the LPA is not visualized for that. So at that time, we have to invest time and effort to delineate if this RPA, if this LPA is present or really, really absent. So here, for example, that we have here an echo that we have an RPA. Also, when we do a CT, what we do by CT, we just inject the contrast and the blood will be, will have another color, will be brighter. So here we have an RPA and we have an absent LPA and visualized. Here in the CT, still like echo, you might detect another origin of the LPA or higher origin or another source of plus supply but if you are not able to see the LPA at this stage we call it unvisualized LPA so we are not sure if it's absent or still present so what we will do after this next step we have to send this patient for CAH this is the first time we talk about the CAH the diagnostic CAH in, in the trilogy of fallow so we do what we call it pulmonary venous wedge injection so the left is not visualized so we go from the femoral vein to the right atrium cross the septum through the BFO if there is if there is a BFO they are lucky to have a BFO or do a septostomy so by neither they claw so they 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 cross the the septum to the left pulmonary and which the, the, the catheter in the pulmonary vein and the inject. And what we see retrograde will be the filling of the artery if it's present. If it's not present, so we concluded by that, that left pulmonary is absent and we have to deal with this patient as a single lung, if it's possible or not possible to repair. Again, so if we are not able to visualize a pulmonary artery from the peripheral usually it's to the left so we go for the ct it might depend on the duct it might be coming from other origin so we are aiming to visualize it by better assessment for cross imaging and that again in that if you are a que if your question about the pulmonary arteries you don't have to be gated because it's an extra cardiac structure but it's not wise if you are going to uh, do a ct for tetralogy of fallow just do it get it to look to, to have an overlook for other view, but particularly for this question, it does not have to be get. Uh, so if you are not able to visualize it by CT, don't rush to call it absent LPA. 
it is unvisualized also by CT and we have to go for this step which is a bit tricky because you have to do if you don't have a PFO you have to perforate the septum and go for the LPE and do the wedge injection for that a bit tricky it's not impossible but it's a bit tricky a tricky step keep it if you need it and do a pulmonary bean wedge injection if you have an LPA so we have to report that either to invest in this LPA to make it bigger or to decide to go for single lung repair so this is this is a crucial point and it, it is the only uh, the only time that we need um, a catheterization pre -fallow. Is that clear? Okay. Okay, this is the echo for that. Okay. What do you see in that uh, in that image? Short axis view. It's short axis view, the membranes VSD, anterior cephalic deviation of that septum, so we find the diagnosis of the torch of fat. Okay. Here we see an IP is not large, it is aneurysmally dilated. So this is a bit unusual for the torsion fella. You see it? All of this is RP. You see it? Is it clear? Is it clear that this is the pulmonary bulb? The position of the pulmonary bulb? And this is huge dilated RPA. This is a peculiar type of tetralogy of fallow. We call it tetralogy of fallow with absent pulmonary bulb. Usually, it is associated by aneurysmally dilated central pulmonary artery. So LPA and RP is not normal. It's not normal in size, but they are over. This is aneurysmally dilated. Actually, um, the the name of this uh, peculiar tetralogy fallow is a bit deceiving. So we call it tetralogy fallow with absent pulmonary bulb, which is a bit confusing with pulmonary atresia, because if you don't have a pulmonary bulb, it should be atretic. And if we have a pulmonary atresia, we shouldn't have uh, we shouldn't have a forward flow between that and we shouldn't have a, a, um, a sizable pulmonary arteries let alone to be that aneurysmally dilated. So if you think about this is uh, the terminology absent pulmonary valve but if you think about it like absent pulmonary cusps actually what absent in that that we have an annulus but we don't have cusps for that pulmonary so actually it's not absent pulmonary valve but absent pulmonary cusps so we have narrowing we have constriction at the size of the at the site of the pulmonary valve at pulmonary annulus and this is a, a bit a bit, this is a, a quite um, constrictive this is protective for the lung so we have gradient of 100 100 plus over it but we have also free pr because we don't have um a stenosis in that so if we think about this terminology like absent pulmonary cusps instead of absent pulmonary valve it might relieve the conflict in our mind it's not atresia we have a forward flow and it's usually associated with this aneurysmally pulmonary we don't know until now why might be a syndrome or some pathogenesis in the pulmonary artery but we found it so it absent pulmonary cusps we still have a forward flow in that and we still have a gradient so it is a protective a protected lung from that usually those patient um, comes to the clinic in um, in the adult hood. so because they are not that cyanotic so usually they are messed so they come they are pink fellow to 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 degree or extent so they usually in this in their high 80s but if you find that in this echo, like it's not it's not sizable pulmonary artery, but this is over dilated, this aneurysmally dilated. Usually, you think about if this patient is tetralogy of fallow absent pulmonary valve, absent pulmonary cusp syndrome. What the point here that this have aneurysmally dilated pulmonary arteries usually compress the airways. So, if you look for that, ask for CT chest for this patient. 
if you need to do to do it for that because usually they have a compressing dynamic dynamic because this pulmonary artery is getting dilated in systole and regressed during diastole so the, they compress the airways and it's not uh, uncommon to find nematocele or lung abscess or whatever in that so look carefully for the airways look carefully for the lung itself if you have this picture and this picture is pathognomonic for the follow follow-ups in pulmonary valve like a butterfly it is a neurismal dilated okay Okay, we will go now for the extra pulmonary blood supply. And again, we think about it. If there is discrepancy between the clinical picture, the cyanosis, if the cyanosis is lower than expected, so we think about if this lung have a pulmonary blood supply other than the BZ pulmonary blood. Other than what? Other than BZ. BZ is not a blood supply for the lung. The lung have in the tetrosia follow, they have only the blood supply through the pulmonary artery, which have been stenotic by the coronary septum deviation. So again, cyanosis in tetrosia follow is mainly due to low pulmonary blood supply. So we are aiming in palliative treatment of tetrosia follow, next, next step that we said, if we are not able to correct the follow in corrective way, so are aiming to do something to increase the pulmonary blood supply. Is that uh, clear? Okay. So the source of pulmonary blood supply, when we suspect if the clinical condition, if the cyanosis is not going with the clinical condition that we see. The source of pulmonary blood supply, it is either to be adapt or a collateral. So it is either adapt or a collateral. So that we also we have in the clinical practice, that we have here, the, this is suprasternal view, this is long axis, we have here the aorta, so this is the descending aorta, and we have some things from the descending aorta is going, so this is, this is a view that we have to suspect that this patient have collaterals. This is the maximum that we can go by echo, and we have to ask for another imaging modality, that it will be multi CT. Okay. This is how we saw it again okay. much like CT with higher spatial resolution it is our modality to um, image the collateral so the collateral is we call it um, our two pulmonary collaterals Sometimes we give it M, M4 major, so we call it MAPCAS, the major aortic pulmonary collateral. So the MAPCAS have different morphology. This one is MAPCAS. This one is MAPCAS. So we have different morphology about that. The rule is we have an aortic pulmonary collateral from the aorta to the pulmonary circulation. Collateral does not come from ascending aorta. So if you find something coming from the ascending aorta to the lung, it is pulmonary, it's not collaterals. We don't look for the collaterals in the ascending aorta. Aorta comes from the arch, from the ascending aorta, from the neck vessels, but not from the arch. Anything is coming from the ascending aorta to the lung, it is pulmonary artery, it is not. Okay. Cath could be, could be needed in the collaterals, but not the first step. We do the mud slice CT as road mapping. So collaterals can come from anywhere, from the, from the arch on the surface, or from the neck vessels, or from descending aorta, or from descending aorta thoracic or abdominal. So it's not logic to do a road map by catheterization. This is a lot of uh, contrast, a lot of radiation. So we do the mud slice CT as road mapping for this. OK, this one. This one is a collateral collateral from the subclavian going to the lung. This is here, a large collateral coming here. You look for the different morphology. Sometimes it's cylindrical shape, it's a small. Sometimes it's big, it's coming with a constriction and giving to the, to the lung. I'm showing the different, different types of this collateral. Okay, CT can answer about 
four questions about the map cast except one question. Okay, so it comes to the size. We measure the size of the collateral at the origin, at the insertion, and we say the size of the collaterals to give it the M, the measure, or it might be small, minor collaterals for that. How can we tell? It's not clear in the literature, but some publication said if it's more than 2.5 millimeter index for body surface area, it is a significant collateral, we call it M. This is, a, it's not clear yet in the literature, but we depend on that. So we call it the size, origin, collateral does not come from the ascending aorta. It comes from all over the aorta, except the ascending aorta. So we have to describe it. The origin of the collateral to make it a root map for the catheterization, if needed, to make it a root map for the surgeon, is it accessible or not accessible? So we have to describe the origin. It comes from where? Okay, number three. The insertion, here, I'm quite restrictive in, 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 in this point. So the maximum target from the CT that you said this collateral is going to the lung or going to the pulmonary arteries. So this collateral is going to the pulmonary circulation. It might join the pulmonary artery. It might, it might go by itself to the hilum of the lung. So the insertion, we have to say, is it going to the pulmonary arteries? Is it going to the lung? And we will uh, say why it's important to do that. We have to measure the collateral all over its pathway. So from the origin to the insertion, is it the same diameter or it should some stenosis? And this is stenosis, is it more than 50%? or it's lower than 50%, 50% is a rough measurement. Is it, is it um, restricted or is it non-stenotic? So it means that all the pressure in the aorta transferred to the pulmonary. So if it has stenosis, it's a good sign because it means it is protected. It still have a blood supply, but it's protected. So we can answer by multi-slice CT these questions compared to the echo that we saw some colors going all over the place. Here we can describe the numbers of the collaterals. For each collateral we go chronologically from above to down. So from, 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 uh, um, from the head to the lower we say collateral number one, collateral number two, collateral number three. By CT we can describe the site, the origin, the insertion, and we can describe the pathway and there is stomatic or not. Here comes the important question about is it dual or single blood supply to that lung? This is actually the fundamental question. Why? Because if we have a loop, we, can, we loop from each lung, whatever, the right or left lung, we have a loop that receive a collateral and receive a pulmonary artery. So we can close this collateral, either surgically or percutaneous, and invest in this pulmonary artery to be the only blood supply to this lung loop and nothing happened. Nothing happened uh, uh, harm to the patient, I mean, it is, a, it is a good plan. The other thing, that I have the same loop of the lung and we have a pulmonary artery that is supplied by a collateral. So again, if we can restore this pulmonary artery to the heart, we can safely close these collaterals and nothing will happen harmful for the patient. The third scenario that we have a loop of the lung that have a blood supply only from the collateral and nothing is coming from the pulmonary artery. So the plan is to close the collateral. What will happen? Infection. Infection. So we have to keep this collateral by mean or another in the pulmonary circulation. So actually, this is a crucial question. Is it dual supply or single supply for that lung, for that lung group? Actually, it's very squeezing to the multi-slice CT if we answer this question. Usually we keep this question like it is mostly that it is if we couldn't see any arteries so it's mostly single supply for this loop if we find an artery plus collateral 
usually prefer to keep this question for characterization. And what we did by Max Slice CT, we drew a map that we have a collateral coming from the descending aorta at the level of the carina is going uh, from the descending aorta to the hilum and uh, it's measuring xx and there is a stenotic or there is no, no stenosis in that and we leave it for the characterization to the answer if it's dual supply for the two or single supply is that clear so we can answer the four questions by ct but the dual or single blood supply it's a bit tricky question and squeezing too much to ask the ct to answer that question please in go case of, in case of dual blood supply to uh, a single blood yeah. can we close uh, pulmonary supply to invest the other uh, the, blood, the pulmonary flow to the other loops okay why we would like to do that uh, actually there is a loop uh, pulmonary flow uh, in, in which is more physiological mm -hmm. pulmonary. the pulmonary artery or the collateral that coming from the systemic circulation the I, correct, I correct pulmonary okay yeah so it, it, the the aim the aim of the trojan file of, of, of the repair that you go for by ventricular repair, right? Uh, uh, shoe. So the, the pressures in the, in, the, in the aorta is much, much more than the pressure in the um, pulmonary, exactly. So if you put this, uh, this loop in, in, uh, in that blood supply, the collateral, so are putting the systemic circulation to the, well, this loop, it will become hypertensive. The other origin, the other option is to, to, uh, cut this uh, collateral from the aorta and the insert it in the heart yeah yeah this is will be um, uh, quite funny to do that to close the pulmonary artery and uh, to replace it by collateral so might be a good option for Hatim to answer that the other the, the second thing before I give uh, the floor to Hatim that the collaterals uh, histologically is not pulmonary artery it is, is, it is um, a vessel that contains a lot of the small, um, small... Um, it may have uh, some that? significant... Constriction. It tends to constrict the antistinos. Hatma, you might uh, explain that? So, so the, the aim for the repair is that the whole blood flow to the lungs come from the right artery. Because we want to close the BSD and you do not want any chunks. So you do not want to systemic to pulmonary chunks. Yeah. So if the aim is to do that, uh, you either do that as a single stage, you just close the VSD and repair the PS, and that's it. But then if, if some loads of the lungs are supplied by, by collateral flow from the aorta, then um, if that's the, single, the only supply, you have to disconnect that from its systemic supply. And then you connect it into the pulmonary, and then all the the pulmonary blood flow will be coming from a single focus, which is the main PA branches, and so that that's why they call this unifocalization. So at first, uh, the pulmonary uh, blood flow is multifocal because. One artery is coming from the subclavian, one artery is coming from the descending aorta, one artery is coming from the naked PA branches. So the, the pulmonary blood flow is multifocal. You want to turn that into a unifocal blood flow, blood supply. And this single focus is the main central PA branches that can be connected to the RV and then you get total uh, recovery. So we do it only if we have to do that. If it's single supply, if this collateral is a single supply for that lung, so we have to invest in that. But this is not the common tetralogy fallow. This is pulmonary atresia PSD with collaterals coming in the, in the next lecture. But here at this level, we think about where the blood is coming to the lung. Is it dual or single blood supply for that? And, and it is quite a challenging and a difficult operation. So if this lung segment has dual supply, there's no need to do this difficult operation because you can just close that systemic supply because it will act like a left right chunk. It's, it's like a PDE physiology which is not tolerated after the repair to, to have still left right chunks. So if there's a dual supply, you, uh, you just close the, the collateral flow coming from the systemic arteries and you depend on the PA branches. 
uh, but if it's a single supply, then then you have to do something like that. For example, when we go for this uh, for, for for this two, there there are two patients about that. If we describe that, this is a small collateral that is coming from the subclavian, so the origin is the subclavian. So it's going in tortuous way, and we can measure it by millimeter, and we index the blood surface area. And here, the insertion, this is the origin, and the, this is a one collateral heat. And the origin is from subclavian, and the insertion is in? In the MPA, the left, or the origin of the left. I think it's this is the MPA, this is the left. We're looking from the behind of the heart. So it's going to the lung. So actually, here, do what or single supply, it's not a question because it doesn't go to the hilum, it's going to the LB. Is it, is it accessible from the surgery point of view or not? This one is accessible. Uh, it, this one is accessible because this, this view is clear for the surgeon. So if you report that, so in the total repair, you just clamp this uh, collateral or close it. If you compare it by this, uh, by 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 this uh, by this uh, CT, also we are looking from the behind. So actually, we have here a large collateral is coming from the descending aorta. You can make it a landmark like carina one centimeter or whatever here. So actually, this a large collateral that you have, have significant narrowing here. And it's going directly to the lung. So actually, the, the pulmonary arteries is not in the view. I think this case does not have a pulmonary arteries. I'm very diminute for that. But I expect that this collateral have a major contribution and supply of this loop, right? So we are not able to just to write this collateral off and just to close it. We have to invest in this collateral to recruit this collateral to the circulation if we can. Another point about this collateral, we cannot call this collateral by CT, it is hypertensive loop or hypertensive lung because this have a quite significant stenosis in that. So again, we, we can say the number of the collaterals, we can say the origin of the collateral, the insertion, the insertion here into the lung, it have a stenosis, significant stenosis in that. So, we have to deal with this collateral, either to recruit this collateral in the unifocalization if we can. If we are not able and this patient will go for palliative treatment, like, like we keep this patient like it is, we might think about stenting of this collateral to improve the pulmonary blood supply. Anyway, this will come in the next lecture, but for that, multi-slice CT is mandatory for collateral root mapping. For collateral zoom, we can, with high level of certainty, answer about the numbers, the size, the stenosis, the origin, and the insertion. We have to be quite um, um, conservative about answering the dual or single blood supply. In this case, in this post case, I can answer this question. This here is a single blood supply for the lung from the pulmonary arteries. In this case, I can see that these collaterals have a major contribution in the blood supply, and we have to go for CAT to demonstrate that. Is that clear? And the oh. extra benefit of doing CAT in s such cases is that you can measure, measure uh, pressure. pressures distally, and then you can say, is that stenosis significant or not? Exactly. Because sometimes it's just a, a, a kink, and then is that kink actually dropping the pressure or not? So um, uh, an extra benefit, especially if the patient is is older, because if is if the patient is young, it wouldn't make a lot of difference because the the he wouldn't have developed irreversible pulmonary vascular resistance. But if the patient is quite old, so like seven eight years, then uh, this lung this part of the lung might be hypertensive, hypertensive with irreversible increase in pulmonary vascular resistance, and this would be segmented from hypertension, and then measuring pressures. Uh, in, in each collateral might actually be very, very important. Again, this type of collateral is very small collateral, but we can find that it's very small collateral. Here is another story. Okay, so we mentioned multi slice T many times in, uh, in the Trojo Fellow. Actually, uh, in, the current, in the current era, that multi slice CT is. The, the, the cross imaging modality for the treasure column, but here much slice CT. Why not? Because when we have a publication about the radiation hazards in much slice CT, look for this curve. 
here in 1975, this is the number of publication but going to the late 2000 plus that we have more publication about the hazards of the radiation. So again, what slice CT have the hazards of the radiation, we have to do our best to decrease the radiation dose for children. So we have a lot of technique that as low as possible uh, uh, reasonable achievable uh, dose we call it alara so we have to, to for all people that working with much city that you have to do your best to decrease the radiation the radiation dose keep the field view as small as you need not to open all of the field keep it gated or non gated as the question of that don't open the radiation dose for the whole cardiac cycle if it's not needed just make a shot during history and during the history so we have to be aware of, about that take home message that one much slice ct is not the end of the world but you never know when your patient will need this much slice ct for other uh, for other reason limit the exposure as much as possible and look for alternative if this available um always say that having said that i'm supportive the much slice ct when needed for the tutorial of follow one much slice CT is not the end of the world, but ask your patient to keep the much slice the CD uh, with it, the raw data, just not to be repeated again. We are doing the radiation hazard for this patient, but again, it's needed in that. Um, okay, now I'm done with that. To recap, the initial diagnosis of uh, of uh, tetralogy of fallow is done by echo, no role for much slice CT or catheterization. In doing that, Cardiac MRI does not exist in the diagnosis of the of fallow. Actually, by the, um, the current special resolution and temporary resolution of cardiac MRI, does not have any extra benefit to do with that, but uh, you will see the, the role of uh, MRI in the post-operative, but in the pre-operative, we, we, we hardly ask for cardiac MRI in the diagnosis. So initial diagnosis, no role for much slice CT and no role for catheterization. For the additional lesion, additional BSD, it's very useful to have a much slice CT rather than uh, catheterization due to the 3D orientation of much slice CT. For coronary anomalies, must have uh, a, a much slice CT, not, uh, not cardiac uh, catheterization, level of RV tube extraction if needed, if echo is not enough, so you can do it by much slice CT. For pulmonary artery size, it's useful to have the much slice CT if the echo is not uh, is not useful. Again, we uh, we we do the catheterization in one scenario if the LPE is not visualized neither by echo or by CT. So we do the wedge injection about uh, the, about that. It might be uh, a complementary uh, just to tell the, the interviewers if they have a BFO to make their life easier about that or not. Source of blood supply, much slice CT is a must. Catheterization is a roadmap when the question is about is it dual supply or single supply and to measure the, the pressure after that about that. Is it clear about the question? I'm done. Any questions? Pre-operative CT is not uh, indicated. Pre-operative uh, pre pre as native? To, to exclude this uh, additional lesion. Uh, okay, this is a good question. Uh, in the Wisterian life, they don't do a ma ma a much slice CT because they have uh, an echo in neonatology where you can answer all these questions uh, for, for that. So if you have a recorded echo uh, for a baby, the neonatology, you 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 almost answer all these questions unless you have a question about the pulmonary blood supply. So but you can now about it's a, yeah, the history and the, the system. Yeah, but this I, I mean uh, I mean in the in, uh, in the Australian uh, countries they do it because they have a recorded echo all over it's accessible all the place. But the scenario here in the develop developing country like our country that you will face by the of fallow ten years maybe 20, 40 years it's not repaired so actually the views will be limited and we have to admit the limitation of the imaging modality it's better to be safe than sorry so i will give this uh tetrology fallow a single shot for a multi slice ct and we will ask the patient to keep the multi slice ct for that so it's better to do it in the current scenario hatem you agree with that I mean, even if the patient is like six months or so i would 
almost have very low threshold to do a CT to get uh, idea of coronaries, peripheral K branches, uh, presence of collateral. Um, you very rarely get data that is not um, uh, expected. Uh, expected, but from time to time you, you just get something like that and it does make a big difference in the decision making. So I would get a very low threshold to do a CT almost routine before the that's yeah, routine, yeah, it's uh, about suspicion. Yeah. Almost routine. Almost routine. Okay. okay. Any more questions? Thank you.